Well, hi, everyone. Welcome. It's so great to be on your screen right now, but ugh, seems a bit dirty. Lots of fingerprints. Let me see if I can help you out there. That's better. That was funny, right? Yeah, that was funny. Well, today we're trying something new. A live stream online version of our Sunday worship gathering. We thought that trying this option may help us to be together while we're apart. And even though we'll still upload the sermon on its own to the sermon playlist on our YouTube channel, this particular version that you're watching right now has a few new and unique features. There is a live chat and prayer request button that you can use to reach one of our pastors during this broadcast. Operators are standing by, and by operators I mean pastors. You can also use the chat to interact with other viewers or to simply say hello. And actually, we're gonna pause for a minute for a greeting time before the message, and we'll just see how that works because we've never done it before. Secondly, at the end of the service, we're gonna try something that we're calling the after party, where Kurt, Allison, and myself will be live on a Zoom call that you can join to discuss questions and ideas that arise from this morning's message. So if you'd like to be a part of that, there will be a Zoom link in the chat at the end of the service. And here's how we're gonna roll this morning. David will be up next to lead us in musical worship. The words will be available on the screen for you to join in. But if you'd rather just take it in this morning, you can do that too. Then I'll be back with one announcement and our digital greeting time. After that, Allison is preaching the final part of our How to Be Ordinary series, and Kurt will be up right after her with some practical tools to help you explore the spiritual discipline of stability for yourself. After Kurt, David will be back for one more song, and then we'll close our time together in prayer. Oh, and just a couple of more things. Number one, parents, you can access teaching and activities for your kids by going to lakeviewchurch.com slash kids or by clicking the kids button on this page. And lastly, if you think there's someone that you know that might benefit or like to watch what we're about to do here, an invitation link has just popped up in the chat window. You can grab that, cut and paste, and send it to who you think might benefit from being a part of this online service. Cool? Okay, here's David. Lakeview family, welcome to church. Church Online, it looks different. We've been in crazy uncertain times, but we're going to worship our God who is unchanging, faithful, the same yesterday, today, and forever. My name is David. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm glad to be a part of this community. I have the privilege of leading worship, so join wherever you are. Um, if you want to sit, kneel, stand, lift your hands, sing along, um, let's worship God in this moment together. Psalm 62, verse 6 says, He, God, He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. Verse 1. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood.
Thanks, David, and thank you for participating. I've got one announcement for you today, and it's this. It's a reminder for you to give as you are able, either at lakeviewchurch.com give or by texting 84321 and following the prompts or through the give link that just popped up in the chat. And now we're going to stop for 30 seconds or so and give you the chance to say hi to one another in the chat. I'll see you there. Welcome, Lakeview, to our last installment in the series, How to Be Ordinary. We've been spending the last few weeks exploring the spiritual practices and how they help place us in the flow of grace and reorient our lives to God. These practices are ancient, and they've been used for centuries by people who have sought to follow Jesus with their hearts, minds, and bodies. And one of the great proving grounds of helpful spiritual practices was the community of the desert fathers and mothers. In the third century, men and women of faith started to retreat to the desert in Egypt in order to sometimes escape persecution and other times to escape the temptations of society and pursue God by shedding all of the comforts of life. People who wanted to glean spiritual wisdom from these fathers and mothers would trek out into the desert to ask their deep questions. It was kind of like climbing a mountain to find a guru and asking him the meaning of life. Now, a trek into the desert might not be particularly inviting for some of us today. We'd rather just Google or ask Siri what the meaning of life is. But the wisdom of the desert fathers and mothers has something to teach us today too. Listen to this tidbit from Abba Antony. Someone asked Antony, what must one do in order to please God? Antony gave the man the usual answers. He told him to pray and to read the scriptures, but then he added this, in whatever place you live, do not easily leave it. In whatever place you live, do not easily leave it. Abba Antony says, along with prayer and submission to the scriptures, the best way to please God is by practicing stability. Stability is the practice of committing to specific places, practices, and relationships. It is the practice of submitting our freedom to certain boundaries because we believe that channeling our energies is the way we build a life of integrity and faithfulness. Listen to these words from Psalm 1. Oh, the joy 
of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither and they prosper in all they do. The psalmist sounds a little to me like Abba Antony. Know God, meditate on the scripture, and be a tree. So if you've ever planted a tree, you have some idea of what Abba Antony and the psalmist are talking about. I lived on an acreage for 12 years. We bought the house in 2006 from the original owners, Bruce and June, who built the house in 1979. But before they built the house, Bruce started planting trees. Now a huge row of poplars borders all four sides of the property with a row of pine trees on the inside and large bushes of lilacs on the outside. Now I don't know what the property looked like when they first planted the shrubs and trees, but I imagine they were pretty tiny. But I do know what they looked like when we bought the house. My kids played in the leaves of those trees. They cleaned the leaves up every fall from those same trees when they shed them. And it always seemed to happen at one time and always on Thanksgiving weekend. They climbed those trees. Those trees sheltered us from the snow. And when we left the acreage, those trees had grown bigger. And in them, we had built a life just by staying in one spot. Now, three years ago, I sold the acreage to another family. You might recognize this guy. Nathan and Ashley Rushton own the acreage now, and now they're building a life there. And along with that life, they have planted a new shelter belt of trees. Look at how little those trees are. Look how little Rowan is. But give them time. They won't stay that way. Imagine what those trees will look like in 30 years. They'll be like the ones that surround the house now. And in the meantime, the life of another family will have been built in the middle of them. And what it takes is just to plant them, to let them root, to put them in one place. And in the same way, choosing and honoring limits in our lives has the potential to bring abundance and growth, to help us build a life of meaning, to help us be a tree. And this is a picture of the practice of stability. You see, stability helps us counter the false promises of our culture, the promise that the key to our happiness and contentment, that the good life is in another place with another person or another community. In fact, our culture values freedom above everything. It tells us that if we place any limitation on our freedom by making choices, we have somehow undermined something essential about our humanity. And our obsession with freedom has put us in an impossible place. Because as soon as we choose something, we've undermined our freedom to choose whatever we want whenever we want, and therefore are no longer free. It's an impossible conundrum because we are set up to be free to do anything, free to do anything but choose. But the scriptures say something else about our freedom. Listen to Galatians 5. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, 
ugly parodies of community, and I could go on. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard, be a tree. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. This passage makes it clear that freedom is given to us so that we can choose. That's what it's for. Kind of like a hammer is meant to pound a nail or scissors are meant to cut things. They're worthless tools if we don't use them. And freedom is also no good if we don't use it to make choices. Freedom is not an end in itself. It is meant to be used for something like the building of a life. And stability helps us to use our freedom to make choices that border our lives. And like this passage says, that marshal our energies and our resources so that we can build lives of meaning and integrity, so that we can be a tree. Stability also has the capacity to transform us and our world. So about 20 years ago, I moved to Vancouver along with my little family to go back to school. Now, I grew up on the prairies and I hadn't lived anywhere else but here in Saskatoon and in Alberta. And I remember arriving in Vancouver and wondering why no one had ever told me such a beautiful place existed in Canada. And I thought, this is how they keep you on the prairies. They don't tell you Vancouver exists. I arrived at the beginning of the school year. September was gorgeous. The snow did not fall in October. The trees were still holding their leaves and color in November. The grass was green. You could go to the beach. It was amazing. And then December hit. The rain started to fall and it felt like the sun never came up. It was cold, like wet cold, not dry cold. Wet cold is colder than dry cold, even minus 40 dry cold. But that might be my prairie conditioning talking. I was also in the first trimester of my second pregnancy and was losing my breakfast most mornings when I brushed my teeth. And I started to long for the frigid, clear, sunny days of the prairies. Now, eventually February came and the trees started to blossom in February. And I saw magnolia trees for the first time and Vancouver won my heart back. It kind of still has it, but the point remains. Vancouver is not perfect. And you've probably experienced this before too. A new relationship, a new city, a new community, everything is shiny and new and nothing seems out of place. We found that thing that we're looking for, the person who will make us happy forever, the people who are not annoying and hard to live with. Except we haven't, because no place, no person, no community is perfect. And we all know this if we've been a part of a friendship or a marriage or a community for long enough. If you stay in one place or with one person long enough, you'll eventually see how the sausage is made and things won't seem so appealing anymore. But that doesn't mean it's time to leave. Most of the time, I would say, that's actually an invitation to stay because it means that the good stuff, the real stuff, is about to happen. And this is where stability comes in. Stability is the practice that helps us to stay long enough in relationships or places to see the cracks, knowing that this is the time when transformation happens, knowing that the cracks are how the light gets in. When the cracks start to show, this is when we need grace. And stability is the practice that embodies gracious faithfulness, 
the promise that we will not run from others when they need us to show grace, the promise that we will practice patience and forgiveness and compassion and kindness in order to sustain relationships. Stability is also the promise that we will not run from ourselves and abandon the place and people that expose us, that reveal our own need for grace and transformation. The Benedictines are a monastic order that are marked by three vows. They border their lives with a vow to obedience, a vow to fidelity, and a vow to stability. Their vow of stability is the promise to live in a particular place their whole life with the same people, the same brothers, in that place their whole life. Hospitality helps sustain the stability. But one Benedictine monk remarked that hospitality is often far easier to show with outsiders than with the brothers in their own monastery. Sometimes, he said, someone knocks and you open the door and see one of your own brothers again and say, oh Christ, it's you again. I know this feeling. I cannot tell you how many times I do the dishes of the three young adults in my household. It sometimes feels like the main task in raising them is cleaning up after them. And sometimes this tempts me to treat them with impatience or even disdain. It feels like my life would be easier if they gave me more space. But what if in treating them with disdain, I am also treating Christ with disdain? What if in the longing to avoid the hardships of close proximity with my kids, I am also avoiding myself and also missing God? Listen to this. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. And when it was time for Mary and Joseph and Jesus to go home, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. But then Herod died, and an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said. Take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel, because those who were trying to kill the child are dead. And then, after being warned in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. And this fulfilled what the prophets had said, he will be called a Nazarene. Jesus, God incarnate, is born during the time of Herod. He is born in a place, Bethlehem, and is from a place, Nazareth. His family is forced to flee from the hands of a leader who wants to kill him. He is subjected to circumstances that are beyond his control. God commits to a particular time and place. God limits God's freedom by choosing to be one person, by choosing to exist in one body, the body of a Middle Eastern Jewish male born to one family into one particular culture in one particular place. The God of the universe, the God who fills all things, who is in and through and above all things, submits to the things God created and becomes a person. God submits to the particular in order to embody faithfulness to all of creation. And God invites us to do the same. Do you want to love the world? Then commit to particular people and love them well. Faithfulness is not embodied by looking for another perfect place or people. It is embodied by staying faithful to one imperfect community, one imperfect person, by rooting in one imperfect place. Do you want to change the world? Be a tree. Commit to being changed by and changing one place, one community. Do you want to find Jesus? 
he shows up in the limitations of life. And often, if we find him missing, it's because we have spent more time looking for him in another place with different friends, different kids, and a different community when he's been here all along, incarnated in our lives. Listen to this. As we are searching for God, the good news is that God is searching for us. Better yet, he has found us. The great question is not whether we have found God, but whether we have found ourselves being found by God. God is not lost. In a word, we were lost in living what we told ourselves was the good life. We wanted more and more of it, and the more we had of it, the more we longed for what was beyond the reach of our longing or the grasp of our possessing. In our longing and our searching, we were blind to the gift already given, Emmanuel, God with us. And so we are invited to give up our searching and let ourselves be found by the one who wants to be with us and to have us with him forever. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. It's the beginning of the season when we wait for the arrival of Jesus. And this Advent, we are living within limitations we have no control over and couldn't have imagined in years past. Don't be discouraged. Because when Jesus showed up the first time, it seemed like the limitations actually paved the way for his coming instead of hindering it. And maybe these limitations are an invitation to stand still, to let ourselves be found, to practice stability, to learn what it means to be a tree rooted and discover that while we were looking for Jesus out there, He was right here all along. This Advent season, my hope for you is that you will have many chances to open the door of your ordinary, limited life and say, Oh, Christ, Jesus, it's you. Yeah, Allison named it so perfectly. We are living with limitations we never imagined before. I like the idea that we're learning what it means to be rooted like a tree, to be steadfast, sturdy, stable, to embrace the reality that we are in a particular place, surrounded by particular people with particular opportunities to follow Jesus and to extend his love to the world around us. You know, throughout this month, we have been exploring different ways that we can embrace ordinary ways to simplify our lives in order to become more aware of the ways that God is at work in the world and at work in our lives. See, the practices of silence, solitude, and simplicity, they help us create room for the priorities of the kingdom to rest deeply in our minds and hearts. The practice of stability keeps our focus and our energy directed at the things that God has invited us to live into. It helps us to embrace the truth that God has placed us where we are and has called us to play our part in his story right where we find ourselves. Depending on the season of life you find yourself in, you might feel a bit more rooted or perhaps a bit less rooted than others. My family has been living in Saskatoon for five years now. Prior to that, we lived in four different homes over the course of six years. So I know what it feels like to be a bit untethered at times. And I remember when we were thinking about buying the house that we currently live in, Tara was like, do you like this house? I was like, yeah, like I'm super stoked about moving here. And Tara was like, that's good because we are living in this house until we die. Okay. Safe to say she was ready to start setting down some roots. Maybe you're long retired and settled right in with deep roots holding you firm. Maybe you're on the cusp of retirement and sensing a new freedom that you haven't felt for a long time. Maybe you're like me and my family with young kids and you feel like those roots are starting to sink deeper and deeper. 
Maybe you're in college feeling completely untethered and wondering what the next few years might hold. Or maybe you're in high school and you're just like excited to look ahead when you can be free of the constraints of your parents and you can just head out and you can discover all the possibilities that the world holds. No matter what season of life you find yourself in, I don't think it really matters. Maybe you can look ahead five years and confidently predict where you'll be. Or maybe you look ahead five years with no idea what possibilities the future holds. The spiritual practice of stability calls us to be rooted in this moment, rooted in the days ahead, rooted in our devotion to Jesus and his kingdom, no matter what life throws our way, rooted in our commitment to join God in the renewal of all things right where we are. So what does that look like in our daily lives? Well, I've got three invitations for you to consider. Three ways to help you remain stable as you keep moving forward in your journey with God. The first invitation is to declutter your commitments. Many of us have found that COVID has actually imposed this upon us. And while I truly grieve many of the things that I used to enjoy, especially playing sports, I have actually found it life-giving to have more breathing room in my calendar it's allowed me to enjoy way more time with the most important people in my life, my family. You see, that's what decluttering our commitments is truly about. It's not about saying no to things because they're bad. It's about saying yes to the things that are important to us. So if you wish you were the kind of person who read more books or spent more time in prayer or spent more time outdoors or maybe spent more time with your children, Maybe you need to consider the things in your life that are taking up your time and cut some of those things out. The second invitation is to embrace a new pattern that directs energy and focus towards the life you want to be living. Can I suggest that once again, COVID might actually be offering an opportunity? Okay, so show of hands, for real, like let us know in the chat, how many of you have started walking or running way more in the past nine months than you ever have before in your life. Hasn't that been so refreshing? I remember back in early COVID, our family had a routine of going for a walk together every night after supper. It was so lovely. It was time spent breathing in fresh air. It was quiet and peaceful. We were being active. It was time together with the people we love most. It was time to hold my wife's hand it was time to listen to whatever random thoughts came to my kiddos' minds. One little pattern has the possibility to bring a sense of stability to an entire household. So I invite you to imagine the kind of life you want to live into and consider one way you can place a pattern in your life towards that end. See, I used to struggle finding quiet time alone with God to start my day. I tried doing it early in the morning before the kids were awake, but it turns out that Penny likes to wake up at 6 a.m. and I'm not setting my alarm in the fives. So I used to try pulling out my Bible while I ate my breakfast, but you can probably imagine that our kitchen isn't the most serene area of the home in the morning. So a few months ago, I started simply bringing my breakfast into the living room. And sometimes I'll put in some earbuds and play some chill background music and it allows me to enter into a really peaceful space where I can settle in, I can read my Bible, and I can spend some solid time in prayer. Is there a new pattern that you can embrace to help bring some stability to your life? Final invitation is to develop a rule of life. Now, I could spend an entire sermon talking about a rule of life, but essentially, it's an ancient tradition based on embracing a set of spiritual practices that guide us more deeply into the Christian life. One author describes the rule of life as an intentional, conscious plan to keep God at the center of everything we do. And if you like, you can spend your own time reading more about this, but can I suggest a simple place to start? And that is with our Lake For You Church postures. Are you familiar with those? You see, our postures, they essentially paint a picture of the way we want to position ourselves as Christians to join God 
and the renewal of all things. You can find them on our website, but if you need a little refresher, the postures are backward, locating ourselves in God's story, forward, anticipating God's movements, inward, creating sacred space to encounter God, and outward, collaborating with God locally and globally. So maybe this week, you could sit with those postures, pray over them, and get a sense for the kind of life they are inviting you to embody. And perhaps you could start to map out the ways that you are personally going to embody them moving forward. And maybe that will involve continuing in some of the patterns and practices that you're already living into. And maybe that will involve adopting some new patterns and practices that will help you reorient your life more fully around Jesus. All throughout this month, we have been invited to embrace limitation, to slow our pace, to turn down the noise, to declutter the distractions, to simplify, so that we can fully live into the life we have right where we are. Maybe five years from now, you'll be in a totally different place. But for now, let's sink our roots deep into the opportunities before us to love God, love others, and tell his story. Family, let's respond. Let's sing together. Oh, come, let us adore him. shall we? And if you feel comfortable, I invite you to take a posture of openness and surrender. And in the spaces, I invite you to add your prayers to mine. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray for stability for those that we love. Everything feels so unstable right now. And it feels like one big domino effect, something upsetting, a disappointment, something doesn't go our way, or a surprise that we did not want. So we pause now to pray for those we love 
whose lives are feeling unstable. And Lord, now we pray for stability in our world, even outside of the pandemic. The world still goes on with the same problems that seem to multiply every single day. So we pause now to pray for the instability in our world. And finally, God, we pray for stability in our hearts, for those of us who feel really uneasy, who feel like things are boiling over on the inside, for those of us feeling stressed or panicked or unsure about whatever is coming next. God, we pause now to pray that you would stabilize our hearts. And with all of that, we say thanks. So Jesus, root us in who you are. And in this coming week, may we find ourselves firmly planted in you. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, love God, love others, and tell his story. Have a great week, everyone. And don't forget to click the Zoom link in the chat if you'd like to join Kurt, Allison, and I for the after party. All right? See you there. Mm -hmm.